Hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Hanley and it's my great pleasure today to welcome you to today's online event. Um, I'm honoured uh, to have the chance to talk this afternoon to Peter Apps. Uh, Peter's the deputy editor of Inside Housing magazine and broke a story on the dangers of combustible cladding 34 days before the fire at Grenfell Tower in June 2017. He's reported on the fire from the very beginning and has worked closely throughout with the Grenfell community. And his coverage of the inquiry has been um, praised by the FT and the Huffington Post. Um, he's now the author of the extraordinary book, Show Me the Bodies, How We Let Grenfell Happen, uh, which is, a, frankly, um, astonishing and deeply distressing um, and extremely thorough accounts of the events leading up to the fire and the night of the fire and what was revealed at the very lengthy inquiry that has now just finally um, finished, um, finished taking evidence. Um, so Peter, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, I There are so many questions that I have in spite of following as much as I as much as I've been able to the um the, the witness testimonies and the evidence given um and your reporting for inside housing on the inquiry there are still so many so many questions you know of course at the very top of it is why did this happen why did the fire happen well that's <laughs> I mean that's quite a um, there's a lot of answers to that, um, unfortunately. I think um, there's sort of the technical answers which surround combustible cladding products and, um, uh, you know, missing fire door self closers and the lack of evacuation plans and that kind of thing. Um, but there's also sort of broader answers to that question, I think, about the way um, people were neglected and the way that we allowed we sort of handed over to to industry the, the power to write rules um, themselves and I think that that sort of broader story kind of takes us through to some bigger questions about you know how we set things up and how we treat people really and so um, I think it's one of the things that's made this story so um, yeah on the one hand uh, you know complex but also sort of engrossing is, is like the, the many different layers of um things that it's touched on it's it's not you've not been able to just point to one thing and say this is why this happened it's it's, it's had to end up being this enormous um sort of list of of failures which then kind of link back to to, to broader ones um so yeah sorry it's quite a quite a Broad answer to your question, but uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, just to even start from the beginning, right at the beginning of your book, you um, quote, uh, you you use the quote that, that the Grenfell is a lens through which to see how we are governed. Um, did it? Now, obviously, you reported on the issue of combustible cladding just before the fire, and there was also a, a significant fire at Lackanor House in South London in 2009, where combustible cladding also killed, also killed people. Um, so the fact that the fire at Lackanor House happened, then followed by the, you know, incredibly uh, lethal fire at Grenfell, what did it show you? What, what has your research and your, um, you know, very diligent reporting of the inquiry showed you how we are governed. Has it shocked you? Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I think I, probably like quite a few people uh, started out quite cynical, but I think even with um, that, I was, I think, um, I, you know, I called the, the book Show Me the Bodies, How We Let Grenfell Happen. And I do think that that is, that what I want to get across in, in, in the book is that this was allowed to happen. It was, a, it was a series of choices to let a fire like this happen. And I think that the, the, the fact that we saw six people die in London, in South London in 2009, there was a very um, detailed inquest which spelled out why that had happened and the steps needed to prevent it happening again. Um, and then those steps just weren't followed. We, we, we allowed um, that tragedy to be repeated. And the people that I spoke to in that kind of four year gap 
between the Lacknell House inquest and the Grenfell Tower fire all, all said, um, if this happens again at night, then the, 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 the death toll will be much larger because um, people will be asleep and, and by the time they wake up, it, it might be too late for them to escape. Um, and the building will be full as well. With Lacknell House, lots of people are out at work or um, at school. Um, whereas at Grenfell, of, of, of course, the, there were 293 people in the building when the fire started. So um, I was aware of those risks because I, I wrote, I was writing about housing and social housing in that period. And the, the, what the inquiry has shown is that people in positions of power were also aware of those risks and actually made, made very specifically aware of them. Um, and, you know, recorded in emails the fact that, um, you know, there's this polyethylene cord cladding and it goes up like, a, um, I think they just, he, the civil servant responsible just used the word whoosh to, to describe how that stuff burned when it's on the outside of a building and then was warned that that's on use in buildings in the UK. Um, and it, throughout, it was just the other priorities were, were, were given a higher level of importance, you know, whether that's the, the desire to, to to, to spend less money on, on social housing, not install sprinklers, um, not give people the, the, the resources to, to maintain social housing stock, or, or whether it's the, the, the agenda of deregulation, which was an enormous political um, driving force at the time, sort of bonfires of red tape and all of that kind of thing. Those things were considered more important than preventing a repeat of the Lacknell House fire. Um, and, and, and as a consequence of that, you can say those things were more important than protecting the lives of people who lived in tower blocks, especially in social housing. Um, and that's quite a dark um, thing to accept about our political system, um, but it is something which the, the inquiry has spelled out really and, and, and laid out in a sort of a long chain and trail of emails and policy documents and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, that's it's a it's a it's sort of downbeat view of 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 the way, you know, it's not a, not a particularly nice lens to look through, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, it's a it's a true one, unfortunately, and um, yeah, yeah, I, th I think what I found extraordinary reading your book is the the level to which the level to which people are quite happy to blame each other and say, well. I don't make the rules, somebody else makes the rules. And then the person who is making the rules essentially says, well, I've been told I don't need to worry too much about the rules. And this, you know, uh, you know, I'm somebody who's, uh, I grew up on a council estate, not in a tower block, in, in, but on an estate that had lots and lots of tower blocks in it. Um, and, you know, starting with Ronan Point in 1968, so, you know, a, a, the tower block for people watching the tower block that um, partially collapsed in East Hamming, London in 1968. From that moment on, there have been active, um, active campaigners and active advocates, such as the late Sam Webb, who only died a few weeks ago after a lifetime of campaigning about safety in tower blocks. It, it seems to me that the way in which that that like you say that that collusion and collision of denying the need for red tape essentially and how we how we envisage and regard tower blocks in particular and council housing in 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 the wider society do, do, do you feel as though a, a sort of a, an, an electoral you know, because of the, the, the continual electoral focus on um, social housing is something that you need to get out of as quickly as possible and you need to basically be a homeowner in order to be considered a full citizen with full rights. Um, how much do you see that, 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 collision of, that collision of deregulation and social housing once having been regarded as a, regarded as a public service and one that, 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 that came to be, you know, routinely you know stigmatized you know people made feel humiliated to be living in council housing in the first place what what how do you feel that that where do the deepest deepest roots of the the events leading up to the fire start with you 
quite a lot to unpack in that question. Yeah, I think. Um, I know. The, the, um, <laughs> uh, so I think sort of, I, well, I think there's a really interesting thing about all of this, um, which is that, yes, on the one hand, I, I don't know when it comes to talking about it, that, that this is something which undoubtedly affects social housing tenants most ser seriously. It is not a coincidence that these two fatal fires at Lacanal House and at Grenfell Tower happened in um, aging council blocks. That isn't a coincidence. However, uh, the the sort of cladding crisis that has emerged since Grenfell um, has gone much wider than that. So, um, you know, I was struck uh, once to 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 go to a, a block with um, I knew I was going to a block with ACM cladding on it. I didn't really know much more than that, and um, I was, you know. Uh, Perhaps my expectations were were, were were wrong in the first place, but I, I was surprised when I got there to find sort of a very luxury development, waterfront development next to the Thames, Nick and Airy Wharf in London, um, sort of used as a, a sort of week weekday pad by the the the, the bankers at uh, uh, um, Canary Wharf, and it's got Bentleys and Ferraris in an underground car park, and on its walls it has the same cladding as Grenfell Tower, um, and that's you know, and there's that says to us that the, the, the sort of failure of, 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 dereg of regulation, this regulatory failure over the built environment was so deep, that it actually catches everyone. You know, it catches people who, who stay in um, large chain hotels. If you've, if, you've, if you've spent a lot of time staying in hotels, you've almost certainly slept in a building with ACM cladding on its walls. Um, it catches student housing, it catches um, private boarding schools and hospitals. Um, because that's what if you if you don't regulate the built environment properly, everyone who who needs a roof over their heads is is, is a potential victim. Um, so that's one side of it, and I do think that that's important to stress because I think sometimes people don't realise that when they look at the Grenfell story, and so they think um, if they're not people who live in social housing that this is something which can't happen to them. And I I, I do think that people need need that understanding that that it. It's, you know, it does go wider than that. However, um, why did Grenfell Tower uh, suffer the, the disaster it suffered? It's not just to do with the cladding on its walls. Um, the building was allowed to deteriorate. Um, there were a lot of, of, of issues with the maintenance of it. Um, the, the most serious one in terms of the, the, the cause of the disaster was the fact that two thirds of the self-closing devices on the fire doors were missing. So when people fled their, their flats, the, the doors didn't swing shut behind them and um, the smoke was able to kind of escape onto the lobbies and the landings. You, you also had the gas works, which had sort of knocked holes through all of the walls and, and not properly been filled up again. Um, you had uh, um, all kinds of, 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 of sort of long running repairs issues with leaking and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and the thing is, if you go to other social housing blocks, you, you see that over and over again, you sort of see the, the holes in the wall and which are filled up with pink foam and the, um, the gaps under doors. And, and, and it's, it's a real contrast I find when, it, when, when I go into a tower block is the communal areas look quite run down often and quite, um, quite forbidding and, and, and unpleasant places. And then you go into people's homes, into their flats, and suddenly you've got this huge contrast where you're actually in a kind of really warm, welcoming environment. Um, and it just shows that bit, the bit in the communal area is the bit that's owned by the state and the bit that the state are responsible for, for, for maintaining and upkeeping and looking after. And they just haven't done that since the 1980s. The, the amount of money put into into maintaining those bits has been minimal you know we had a little bit of funding under new labor but it's really for kind of new bathrooms and kitchens and that sort of stuff which helps is a, it's kind of a bit of a vote winner if, if you, you you're looking for the sort of um constituent that, that, that they were um but but that sort of day-to-day -day care for those buildings just wasn't there um, and we, you know, the state built those buildings, it owned them, it had a responsibility to look after them and make sure that they're in, in a, a, a habitable state. Um, and then the question is, why didn't they? What changed from the 1980s to say, we don't want to look after these places anymore. We don't want, we don't think that they're worth investment when only 10, 20 years before they've been something that both sides of the political divide in this country would, would compete to build more of um, and we came to look at social housing as a place where um, 
like you say, you you want to escape from, you want to move out of. And that never it never had to be like that. Social housing isn't, it doesn't have to be like that. You'll know that from from your own life experience, I'm sure. It, it's it's not um it, that neglect um was the thing that failed at Grenfell in, in terms of the internal stuff was was missing fire there was self closes primarily there were other factors but that was the primary thing but what led to that position of so many missing fire or self closes was 30 years of neglecting everything um and so it we we put so many failures in place that inevitably one of them was going to have this sort of terrible consequence and 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 that is ultimately what happened and that's kind of what i was talking about in answer to your first question in that you, you have the kind of Grenfell Tower fire caused by one thing, one specific thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but behind that, you have a whole story of failure that then creates all of these different risks. And it's just that one that happens to eventuate there. So, um, yeah, uh, I think that covers that. Oh, you did mention, I did want to say, actually, you you mentioned the name Sam Webb. And um, he's a guy I knew, knew well. Um had an awful lot of respect for. He's quoted a couple of times in the book. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, someone who, who really fought hard um, to stop this happening and um, continued to fight afterwards. He, he represented the families of, of people who died at Lacknell House. He was an expert witness for them. He, he fought a, a campaign of um, ferocious intensity for quite a softly spoken gentleman. Um, for the for the community at Ronan Point, and he continued to do that even in in his eighties towards the end of his life for um, the families at Grenfell Tower and, and and those stuck in 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 many other dangerous social housing tower blocks around the UK. So um, you know, I I, I would have um, I don't think he he was a long term contact at Inside Housing. We we probably would this book probably wouldn't exist without his work. And um, yeah, he's a he's a real loss. We um he 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 passed away a couple of couple of months ago now. Yeah. Um. I mean, in your extensive um, experience of um, writing about the fire in the last five years and in attending the inquiry, um, what is the impression you, you've had from people people who survived the fire and people who had relatives who, you know, who didn't survive the fire, the Grenfell community, people who lived on the Lancaster West estate? Um, the fact that the fact that they themselves had a blog warning that a lethal fire could and would happen uh, and then and then did happen. Have you had a sense of a sort of a wider sense of confirmation that um, they were never going to get listened to and, and partly or not just partly, but 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 to a major extent because they were living on the wrong side of the borough of Kensington and Chelsea and were likely to vote differently, you know, because of class and because of, because of race, you know, there were many different ethnicities, um, people, people of many different ethnicities living in the block, but were overwhelmingly working class. Did that sort of institutionalized, um, you know, be, uh, uh, neglect and being ignored how have you had in, in what kind of ways have you had that articulated to you by survivors yeah um yeah I mean I think that is that is a real part of it for them that's a real and there was a real um concern and I should say I mean this is something I, I you know you do need I think people do need to understand as well how large the Grenfell Tower community is I mean like I said two, 293 people in the building on the night of the fire um some people who lived there who weren't there on that night 72 victims all of whom probably have six or seven people who who would consider them a, a close relative um you know that takes us up to <laughs> I don't do quick maths but that takes up to more than 500 people and then the estate surrounding the towers is, is, is now in the thousands and so sort of making any statement about what the community think is always quite difficult because yeah. of the the size of it but um yes it's a repeated thing, an often repeated thing about the the what um, Eddie Defarn, who who was one of the contributors to the blog you mentioned, refers to as institutional indifference. Um, the, the the place where the fire happened is is unusual because um, you know it's, it's it's a very wealthy borough, a very wealthy part of London, and you know 
wealthy to a level that nowhere else really very few places in the world are i mean the the, the wealth there is is not you know homeowners with nice gardens it's it's sort of billionaire trust funds with um you know whole islands um and it's 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 also got the, the some of the poorest parts of london and some of the poorest parts of the country in which grenfell tower was located and then that creates a particular dynamic in kensington because the council is elected by the the majority rich people in the borough but it is then becomes the landlord of and therefore with this enormous influence over the lives of these people who as you correctly said tend not to vote for it and um tend not to be you know the the the, the people who the councillors themselves are you know nicholas paget brown and rockfielding mellon they don't have that kind of connection to the communities which they are then in charge of the lives of. And so Kensington has a long and detailed history of that sort of, um, it, you know, conflict uh, of which the Grenfell Tower fire is, 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 is the, the, the latest instalment, really. Um, I think, you know, the, the, there's it, the, the, the blog that the, the Eddie and his, his, his neighbor Francis wrote was the thing that everybody heard about after the fire. The inquiry has shown us that, you know, there were also Grenfell residents at Leaseholders Association inside Grenfell Tower were warning about the, 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 the um, difficulties they'd have escaping in a blaze. I think there was an email sent that said um, something to the effect of, um, if we can't get out, people will die. Um, five or six years before the fire, they were pushing the issue of fire safety as well. Um, you had other people sort of isolated voices at times, but talking about issues like fire door self closes, and then people asking about the um, the plastic um, around their windows and whether or not that was fire safe. And you had um, you know Eddie and 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 David Collins and. Um, uh, various other people, some of whom died in the fire, who really did make this huge effort to kind of gather that community together. And um, they got petitions signed and they got their local MP involved, even though she was a Tory, they, she, they still brought her around the table and got um, forced their kind of their, their landlord to, to who, who didn't want to listen to them at all, who didn't even want to come to their meetings or recognise the existence of their group to come along and, and um, you know, at least face them. And that took an enormous amount of effort on the part of people like Eddie and David and Shah Ahmed and um, uh, the, the, the various other people who stood up um, to what was happening. Um, and I think that's one of the scarier things about Grenfell really is that despite that, despite their, you know, this isn't a kind of weak downtrodden group of people. They were fighting against what they saw as a, um, you know the mis their mistreatment and um they didn't they didn't at any stage take this lying down and yet it still happened um the power dynamic was such that they weren't able to um to to to, to uh, they, you know um win some of those fights and then the thing is then after the fire i think hanan wahabi um who she lived in a tower uh on one of the lower floors and escaped during the night with her family but her brother um, and his family, who they were incredibly close to, I mean, like um, really just kind of one family, really two branches of one tree is how it was described by the family's lawyer, um, lived on the, a higher floor near the top of the tower and all of them died, including their eight year old son. Um, and so Hanan um, sort of is, she's a survivor of the fire and she's also bereaved. Um, and she, she said bluntly after the, um, about the way the community was treated in the aftermath of the fire, which is again, it's sort of one of the slightly lesser known things about Grenfell, that people were really abandoned. They were left in, in hotels, they were, they were left to sleep rough, they were um, sworn at and threatened with arrest by the police, they were um, just not given any information about um, uh, where their loved ones were and whether they'd lived or died. Um, she said, if we, were, if we were different, if we were white, if we were from the wealthy part of the borough, we wouldn't have been treated like this. We, the response would have been felt. And I think that she's, you know, she's speaking the truth there. I, I don't think that, um, I don't think that if that fire had happened in, well, I don't think that fire could have happened in one of the, 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 the wealthier um, parts of the borough, but if it had, I, I mean, th there would have been no stone left unturned in supporting that community. Um, and it's, it's a very difficult question um, as to why, why then did that not happen? Why, why were they, 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 they um, 
again, and to quote sort of some of the lawyers for bereaved and survivors, the, um, the response was more interested in public order than it was in, in being a humanitarian response. And, and that wholly comes down to um, the, the, the class and, and ethnicity of the people that were the victims of it. Um, it that's even documented. I mean, the, the Metropolitan Police Risk Assessment um, referred to the risk of disorder um, because of the Islamic um, background of the victims, um, which was described again as by a different lawyer to the inquiry as, as the elephant in the room staring back at us um, in, in terms of the, 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 the level of um, racial prejudice that, that, that involved this. So yes, before the fire, people were left um, against these institutions who, who were really indifferent to their um, well-being and after the fire, they were as well. Um, so and that's something the, 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 the bereaved and survivors have, have asked over and over again for the inquiry to investigate more directly. Um, and that there was a call from Imran Khan, KC, who, who also um, famously represented the, the Lawrence family in the um, uh, Stephen Lawrence um, inquest and in, in inquiries um, to, for the inquiry panel to make a, a declaration and a finding that, that part of the cause of Grenfell was institutionalised racism. Um, so we'll see what the inquiry does with that in its final report. But, um, but certainly the community are not... Um, unaware of of that side of things and are very keen that other people understand that too yeah um having attended um both phases of the inquiry um do you have do you have faith in the panel to produce a report that's were well yeah first do you have faith that the panel will produce a report worthy of the unbelievable um kind of web of collusion and book passing that was revealed during the inquiry and to take into account as you say you know institutes institutionalized racism classism and the you know the kind of bare bare realities of inequality do, do you have faith that the report will well what will, will do the survivors justice um hmm. I think, I think certainly a lot of the bereavement survivors were, were quite encouraged by the first phase report. Um, there was some scepticism around the chair of the inquiry, Martin Morbick, when he was first appointed because he's a high court judge and he, he had some kind of history involving um, cases where, where homeless people were being moved outside of London and um, he, he didn't, um, he, he was, he, his appointment was questioned at first, but um, the, the, the first phase report was was very clear. It was very firm. The recommendations issued to government were, were um, you know, well reasoned. And um, I think the inquiry, the, the, the lots of members of the community were encouraged by that and remain encouraged that because of the way he um, he and the um, uh, panel, he and the, 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 the barrister representing them have, have questioned the witnesses and have left no stones unturned and have, um, you know, not accepted um, easy, easy excuses and easy answers that they are on, on the road to um, putting all of this together. Um, where the inquiry panel does lack a bit of expertise is, is in that issue of inequality. They, 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 there's a three person panel. And bear in mind, the inquiry, the, the, the community had to fight to get that third person on the panel um, to get the, sorry, to get there to be a panel at all. The, the, the government set this up to just be Martin Morbick on the inquiry. And, and it was um, it was the intervention of, of, of their um, campaigning and um, their lawyers that, that forced it into a panel inquiry. Um, there's a. Um, there's a, a third member of the panel who, um, Mr. Akbar, who's a um, housing association chief executive from a, a small sort of community focused housing association in, in Leeds. Um, so he has some knowledge of that, but, you know, being a chief executive of a housing association, even if it's kind of quite a small sort of community focused one, is different from being a tenant of a housing association. And your experience of, of, of life and, and those power dynamics is going to be different as a result. Um, so there is, um, yeah, there is concern uh, among some of the people I've spoken to that the inquiry won't fully understand that and, and will kind of do quite well at the sort of technical stuff and the, the sort of its interpretation of approved document B and various different fire tests, but the kind of more human elements of it, the way people were treated and the way they were made to feel and how that contributed to what happened to them. Um, there's, there's some nervousness that, that, that 
won't quite be picked up so well. Although I would caveat that by saying that the the submissions from the bereaved and survivors um, lawyers on those points have been really powerful. And so, you know, the inquiry just has to listen to them um, in order to kind of find itself in the right place in that regard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the testimonies in your book, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, are just completely unignorable. And mm. as you put the book down, or I put the book down, just, you know, after Hillsborough, you know, particularly uh, after Hillsborough and the, the, the you know, the, 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 the extensive um, inquiry and the lengthiness of that inquiry and the fact that, you know, basically the fact that a whole bunch of people weren't thrown in jail the, pretty much the moment it happened. Yeah. I think I think that's what it leaves you with is why aren't these people in jail right now? Yeah, I mean, I think I would say on that because that is often a question that's asked and um, it, fairly as well. Um, and there's, there's, again, completely understandably some sort of dissatisfaction about the fact that the inquiry process has gone first and taken up so much time when, um, you know, and the police investigation is sort of uh, paused um, in order to, to, to let that process finish. And, you know, I can completely understand those views and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sort of seeking to, to um, dismiss them, but I think it is worth kind of pondering the kind of counter factual situation where the police investigation went first. Yeah. Um, and would we really have wanted all of this information and all of this evidence to come out in a closed room in the Crown Prosecution Services office um, with no public scrutiny of the decisions that were being made and um, the, the defences that were being listened to. I think that, that, yes, it's been a slow process, but getting all of this evidence out into the public domain is so important. And getting it out with a, you know, a nearly 200 million pound inquiry in order to interrogate and give the survivors legal advice so that they can challenge and interrogate everything that's being said and every piece of evidence. Um, it's a slow process, but it could be one that leads to justice. I think it could be. It's not guaranteed, but it's not um, uh, It's not off the table either by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and on balance, I think from my perspective, I'm glad that I, I prefer it like this than the alternative to it being done behind closed doors with, with um, you know, police detectives and Crown Prosecution Service lawyers who wouldn't, with the best will in the world necessarily know the significance of what they were looking at. Um, so, yeah, um, but, it's, but th that said, I mean, that's easier for me to say as, as, as someone who's not a bereaved or a survivor um, and hasn't had to endure the last five years. Um, you know, some people just want justice to come quickly so that they can move on. Um, they don't want this to, to, to be this dominant force in their lives. Um, they want they want it to be finished. They want to they want to feel like they've got justice and that they've got change, so that they can feel like that they, they've honoured the memory of their um, loved ones. Um, and they've been made to wait a long time for that, which is really painful. Yeah, at the same time, you you're very very careful in the book to highlight the fact essentially that the people have been technically able to pass the book or to be basically to to suggest that they were constantly operating within the law because the law was it because because the law itself was inadequate and so that and so um you know I mean what, what one of the things that's been absolutely hair raising about about the inquiry is the way you know just just recently in the summing up has been how arconic the arconic the the the, the cladding firm has has basically being able to say well this what you're trying to pin this on us but it wasn't our fault because of dot 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 you know because the regulation wasn't there because it's not our fault that the fires fire doors didn't didn't close because it's not our fault that the fire brigade tells people in tower blocks to stay put all of these things um will that will that be an impediment to justice um well i mean 
I think it could be. I think that um, I think that it would be easier if there was one party. Um, I think that in almost every instance, though, so long as you you keep in mind that one party's failings don't excuse another party's failings, and so long as you keep in mind clearly what you were blaming this particular organisation for, it is possible to isolate specific failures. I think that you know, we might end up in a sort of slightly messy situation where some organisations, you just can't show causation that's sort of legal to a legal standard, but you can maybe show that they they did some other, um, they, they committed, you know, fraud in the marketplace or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's going to be a case of sort of the, this is again, where the inquiry hopefully will help us is they can break things up and say, okay, you are to blame for this. You might not be to blame for, for the, the state of the UK's regulations, but you are to blame for the fact that in Arconic's instance, a, a product was on the market that, that testing showed was unsafe. Whether it showed it was unsafe under European standards or whether it showed it, but didn't show it was unsafe under British standards because the British standards were defective, they still had some knowledge that it was unsafe and that has to mean something if it doesn't then um where are we really in terms of you know i think it's, it's, it's an interesting thing as we talk about we want kind of truth and justice and change that's the sort of three things that the survivors want and i think there's kind of you can't have any of those without justice really because if you don't have if, if people aren't in the end called to account for it then you can't really stand up. I can't write a book that says an uncaveated, this person was to blame for it until that kind of process of justice has completed. So you can't have truth. And also if you say that you want change, I think the thing that's really gonna change the industry is seeing people taken through the criminal process and punished for it. You know, that's when people will change their behavior is when they um, realize that they're doing, this kind of behavior has consequences. Um, but those things start with justice. And so I do think that we all have to hope really that um, justice is done because um, it's, it's really only gonna be, it's gonna be the only way that, that the bereaved and survivors can move forward, but also that we all can really. I mean, because um, otherwise this, this, is, this is gonna happen again, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's the terrifying prospect, isn't it? And and yet you end the book really with a, a you know, really really impassioned um, kind of message that 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 this cannot happen again, and there has to be there has to be a level of change that addresses you know not just as you say not just the technical aspects of it not just the legislative aspects of it but actually contributes towards changing society so that it cannot so so that bonfires of red tape cannot happen you know in plain sight essentially yeah um what what do you think what do you think the sort of you know the new world that we need to make ought to look like i'll try and keep my um my answer brief. I, I think um, th there was a um, one of the, the lawyers for the bereaved and survivors talked about. Uh, I think, and he went back. I don't know whether you know. I'm not religious myself, but he went back to the kind of fundamental sort of golden rule of, of faith and ethics, which is you know, love thy neighbor as you love yourself. And um, his his message was that um, when people live in in blocks of flats that aren't necessarily like the ones that the people in power live in and the, um, that they might be from a different ethnic background, that that, that that rule just doesn't seem to apply. They don't see them as neighbours. And I think to, to quote um, uh, Karim Masili, who lost his um, uncle in the fire, um, he, he said, you need to see yourself in us. Um, and I think that's, that's fundamental, really. I think um, people, if, if these problems are going to be solved, People need to see, stop parceling up certain communities as um, either victims who bad things happen to, or um, people who 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 maybe we can accept um, that, that that because of who they are and 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 because they have a disability or whatever that um, 
it's okay for for society not to 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 protect them in the same way as it protects other people um and and that just the sort of fundamental statement of human rights really i think that everyone regardless of of whether they're a social housing tenant or a leaseholder or um able-bodied or disabled or whatever deserves the same level of of protection under the under the law and from the institutions that have power over their lives um and one of the fundamental ways to achieve that is to give those people power to fight back when they aren't um uh they aren't being treated properly and i think that's a good thing that grenfell shows us is those people were capable of fighting and willing to fight and actually able to extract victories what they didn't have was any sort of standing within the law or or um resources to 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 access real power and so i think it, some of this comes down to empowering communities and people who, who might be victims of these kind of institutional failures to fight for their own rights and supporting them when they do. Um, yeah, I mean, there's other technical changes, but I think the broader, which is what you asked me, the, the, the broad point, that that's sort of roughly where I put it, sort of somewhere in that space. That, that essentially there's no, no democracy without equality. Yeah, it? absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we have to wrap up now. I'm still, there's still so much I want to ask you about. But uh, for anybody watching, um, I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, Peter uh, for talking to me today and for taking us through what must have been an extraordinarily difficult process of writing this book. And and in, I I, I feel honouring uh, honouring the survivors and the bereaved in their own words, as far as you possibly been able to. So thank you, Peter. Um, and, and to anybody watching today, uh, you can buy Peter's book, Show Me the Bodies um, now, and you can order from Foils uh, with a 20% discount by using uh, the code RSA Foils on the RSA website. Um, and Peter um, writes for Inside Housing, uh, which I recommend you all read um, and uh, tweets on um, at Pete Apps. Thank you, everybody. Um, and this event has been part of the RSA's regular free lunchtime series. Thanks. Bye.